This morning, we're continuing our deep dive into the book of Luke. I love the book of Luke for a variety of reasons, but I'm really enjoying this deep dive into it. And we've been looking in this mini-series of stories of parables that only appear in the book of Luke. Luke is a doctor. He is very into people. He notices things. He notices people. And he just shows us some amazing things. I have three points this morning in line with my good Presbyterian roots. Firstly, prayer and the need for persistent prayer. Secondly, justice. And there are some 2,500 passages in the Bible referring to justice. That kind of shows me that God has an amazing passion for justice. He really thinks justice and us seeking justice is important. And thirdly, faith, or rather the state of our faith or our lack of faith. I have been conflicted in preparing to speak today. I chose this passage. I wanted to speak on this passage. And suddenly yesterday afternoon, I had a bit of a panic in thinking, what on earth did I do this for? It is a real challenge to pray, to speak about persistent prayer. And some of the, what I'm going to say today is a result of a bit of a debate between myself and God. And I have to say it's been good for me. But I hope you'll bear with me. Because prayer has many expressions and the church has a rich and multifaceted several thousand year old tradition of conversation and communion with God. Traditions show us that prayer makes a difference. We can change things by talking to God. We read about Abraham arguing God out of firebombing a city. We read about Moses with his hands held up, changing the outcome of a battle. We read about 10 days of upper room prayer, changing and bringing forth the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Prayer stirs up holy dissatisfaction with the status quo. When we pray, we enter into the fray. Oops. Carol Barth, a Swiss theologian, says, in Christ, We are set at God's side and lifted up to him and therefore to the place where decisions are made in the affairs of his government. And this is what happens in Christian prayer. We then find ourselves at the very seat of government, at the very heart of the mystery and the purpose of all occurrences. That is something to be said about our prayers. When we pray, we are at the very heart of what God is planning to do in this world to bring his kingdom. I was blessed to work with the Leprosy Mission, where prayer was a fundamental part of our daily living, our daily work. A time of prayer was something that we were expected, allowed to do in our working day. And... Alice Bailey, the wife of the founder, Wellesley Bailey, said that the leprosy mission was conceived in prayer, was birthed in prayer, was nurtured in prayer, and grew in prayer. And I can tell you very many stories of answered prayer, but time does not permit this morning. I experienced prayer. My colleagues experienced answers to prayer, and we are still experiencing answers to prayer. One quick answer. Some of you will know that a few weeks ago, the hospital at Anandaban was overcome by a landslide, and one of our colleagues, Vivek, was sadly killed. Now, Anandaban Hospital in a very strong Hindu country is a place of prayer. It is a place that is prayed for. 
And during the tragedy of the landslide, the devastation of a newly built up hospital just been rebuilt after the earthquake. And the landslide has done more damage than the earthquake did. And there was, as I say, the tragedy of Vivek, a young man losing his life. But in the midst of the devastation, there were little pockets of miracles because Anandaband is a place of prayer and it is a place that is prayed for. There were six people in the house in which Vivek was killed and five of them were able to run to safety or were saved. And we don't know what part Vivek played in that. There were 12 people trapped inside the training building and they were all saved and released. Anandaban is a place of prayer and it is a place that is prayed for and it is therefore a place of little pockets of miracles that give us hope in a dark, dark world. And on this Remembrance Sunday, when there is so much conflict in the world, we may ask why God isn't stepping in. Jesus healed the stick. He changed bad to good. So if God has the power to do so, why is he not stopping the war so that the innocent don't suffer? And there are many reasons why God sometimes appears not to be answering our prayers, sometimes appears to be slow in answering our prayers. And I want to mention only four of them today. I want to suggest that sometimes God delays in answering our prayers because he is waiting on people responding to him. Sometimes that is other people, sometimes it can be ourselves. It takes time for people to discern God's will. It takes time for people to decide that yes, they will be obedient to God. It takes time for people to get the resources together to do what God's asking them to do. It could take time, it could take years, it could take decades. And sometimes the change that we're praying for is being prevented because of spiritual warfare. It's lying in the spiritual realms and it's out with human affairs. We're told in Daniel chapter 10 that the archangel Michael is delayed in responding to Daniel because of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is mentioned in the Psalms. Spiritual warfare comes up in Paul's letters when he talks about principalities and powers out with our control. And that requires prayer. And God is sometimes achieving his will in ways we don't know, we don't see, we don't understand. God is like the holding the big picture. He holds all the pieces of the jigsaw and we only see our little bit of the jigsaw. And sometimes God is using us to achieve something that we may never know is being achieved. And we have to trust that God will achieve what he sets out to. And lastly, I would suggest that sometimes we don't have answers, specific answers to pray because we don't ask. We have not because we ask not. How many of us cry out to God for peace and healing for the 92 countries in the world that the Global Peace Index state is involved in conflict out with their borders, plus those who have conflict within. That blew my mind. I could just about get my head round the 32 that I thought was, but it's actually 92. Can we even begin to name them? I could name countries in conflict that the Leprosy Mission works in. I'm interested and I can't come near the 30 odd, let alone 92. We're limited sometimes to what the media shares with us. We're limited to sometimes with what the powers that be decide we should know about or decide that are important to us because there are water, oil, diamonds, food, whatever involved in. How much do we 
pray for peace. And I mean really pray for peace. I don't mean a quick arrowhead prayer in a prayer meeting of many topics, although that is good, that is important, I'm not belittling it. But do we really have a heartfelt cries to God? Do we cry to God day and night? And that has been a huge challenge to me. I am someone who thinks they believe in prayer, the power of prayer. I pray. And in my retirement, I pray more than I've ever prayed before. I believe in justice. I believe in fighting for justice. I believe in working for justice. I believe in praying for justice. But am I doing enough? And that's been the challenge where God has said, you talk a good game, but are you really doing it? And I have to say, I have room for improvement. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this building became a place of prayer? If we became a people of prayer? If this had a time of prayer for peace, for the peace of our community, for the healing and the peace of the nations, for the healing and the peace of individuals. Wouldn't that be awesome? Jesus calls us to be persistent in prayer, to stay with the request until it's resolved one way or the other. How often do we give up? How often we think, I've prayed for this for a week, a month, a year, it's not going to happen, I'm going to give up. Jesus calls us to be persistent and to stay with that request for all the reasons, some of which I've shared this morning, that it's not being answered. If it's God's will, it will come to pass. In the book of Luke, he notices prayer. While prayer is mentioned, depending on the translation you're using, 14 times in Matthew, 12 times in Mark, six times in John, it is some 26 occasions in Luke. Luke notices prayer. Luke shows Jesus praying in many situations, including just before Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah, at his transfiguration, and before teaching the Lord's Prayer. Our Lord prayed before teaching his disciples to pray. Luke shows Jesus encouraging his followers to pray always and never to give up. Only in Luke appears the two parables that encourage persistent prayer, the friend seeking bread and the persistent widow, which is my passage this morning. Luke connects Jesus' prayer to important decisions, such as choosing the twelve. Luke shows te Jesus teaching prayer about repentance and forgiveness. And Luke's emphasis on prayer is said to foreshadow the importance of prayer among believers in the Acts of the Apostles. If you want to see a praying church in action, read the first few chapters of Acts. And now to our passage, it's on the screen if you want to look up your Bibles or your phones. We're going to look at Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Jesus provides us here with a parable about the necessity of prayer, persistent prayer. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones 
who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The parable falls near the end of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and immediately follows teaching about the coming of God's kingdom and the end times. So despite his shift to the topic of prayer in this passage, Jesus' parable continues this end time threads from the previous passage. Now Jesus reveals the imperative of persistence and actively relying on God as we await the end, even though life in this world continues rife with injustice. Jesus begins by telling his disciples that the parable he's about to tell is about praying always and not losing heart. The parable itself, however, focuses on the widow dealing with a judge in a corrupt justice system. Luke twice tells us that the judge in the tale is someone who neither fears God nor respects people. And Jesus himself, which how many leaders in this world could we tell that about. And Jesus himself characterizes the judge as unjust. Regardless though, the widow repeatedly comes to the judge in pursuit of justice. This is conveyed in verse 3 by the tense of the verse. She kept coming. She kept on coming. She tells him to grant me justice against my opponent or quite literally against the one who has treated me unjustly. Despite her plea, though, the judge does nothing. He refuses to act because he's not willing, and he doesn't respond at first. And in the Bible, establishing justice is not so much about punishing the guilty as it is about putting right the things that are wrong. Physical healing and deliverance were just some of the ways that Jesus executed justice in his Gospels. From Jewish scripture, the judge's lack of action is appalling. In biblical texts, widows are counted among the most destitute of society, alongside other vulnerable groups such as the poor, orphans, and resident aliens. Because of their precarious social and economic position of such groups, biblical texts also make provision for them, helping to ensure that they do not fall victim to exploitation. The widow's standing certainly includes her among Luke's concern for the lowly. The widow in the parable resists the temptation, resists the exploitation to which she's been subjected. And like widows before her, like Tamar, Ruth and Naomi, she is not willing to accept what's happening and she takes matters into her own hands. Her persistence and call for justice are such that the judge characterizes her actions as those of a boxer. It's difficult to discern this boxing image though in English translations. In the original Greek though, the judge says, because this widow causes trouble for me, I will give her justice so that she may not in the end give me a black eye by her coming. However, what the English translations do not capture with the meaning of this verb is that they soften the tenacity of the, judge, of the widow. They soften her repeated coming back, her tenacity. They soften her status as a troublemaker to the system. And such translations also obscure the humour that Luke infuses into the scene. We're probably meant to laugh at the topsy-turvy idea of a widow attacking a big judge. I don't know about you, but I see a wee wifey versus a great big burly judge with, for some reason, a great big beard. And the humour in this scene instead pokes fun at the powers that be, the unjust system stacked against widows, orphans and immigrants. Like our political cartoons today, Jesus' parable encourages us to laugh at those who wield their power unethically. We laugh, though, to challenge such figures and ultimately to offer a different way. 
After delivering this short and punchy parable, Jesus offers a few concluding comments that touch on the character of God and the nature of faith. He uses the judge's words as a jumping off point to speak of God's own deliverance of justice, which God will dispense to those who cry out to him night and day. But while Jesus compares God to the judge with this transition, the real point is one of contrast. God is in fact not like this reluctantly responsive judge. God does not need to be badgered into listening. And when God does respond, God does so willingly. If anything, God is more like the widow in her relentless commitment to justice. The widow exemplifies how followers, how we're supposed to be orientated to God. Jesus returns to this emphasis on the behavior of believers with a concluding rhetorical question that recalls his opening statement about prayer and not losing heart. Here he says, I tell you, God will quickly grant justice to those crying out. And yet when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? The final word also recalls his earlier end times discourse and points to other places in Luke where Luke indicates that the Son of Man will only return after an extended delay. By ending on the question of whether he will find faith at his return, Jesus raises several additional questions for us. How do followers not lose heart and maintain the faith that justice will come since Jesus is not returning as soon as some people would like? How are we to act if God justice is not delivered within our timetable? How do we go on in the face of injustice if God's ultimate justice is only to arrive suddenly at Jesus' return? In response to such questions, Luke maintains we're to act like the widow. We're not to wait patiently for Jesus' return or accept our fates in an oppression-ridden world. We are instead to resist injustice with the resolve and constancy of the widow. As Jesus explains elsewhere in Luke, especially in Luke 11, where he, he teaches the Lord's Prayer, prayer is not a passive activity, but one that actively seeks God and pursues God's will. Like the widow, we are to persevere in the faith, crying out day and night to God. This is what persistent prayer looks like. Three points, three takeaways. How do we balance apparently paradoxical truths? How do we balance what appears to be contradictory facts? For example, I'm wearing a red poppy and a white poppy. I wear a red poppy because I am deeply grateful for those who gave their today for all of my tomorrows. I am deeply grateful to people like my grandfather that fought with the Gordon Highlanders in the First World War. I'm deeply grateful to the people, the men, women, and children that gave their lives so that we, must, we might have the freedoms we have. But I wear a white poppy because my ultimate desire is for peace. There has only been one year in this, in the 20th into the 21st century, where there has been no conflict. The 20th century was the most bloody century in all of history, and the 21st century is not any better. We need to pray for peace. We need to work for peace. We need to seek God's shalom in our own lives, in the lives of our community, in the places where God places us. And I can hold these two apparently contradictory facts in balance. Another area where I have had to learn to hold two contradictory views in balance is my love-hate relationship with food banks. I absolutely abhor the fact that in Scotland in the 21st century, in 2024, people need food banks. 
I love the fact that this church, among other churches, among other people and communities and other faiths and people of no faith, group together to feed the hungry. When we do what we do for Food Bank in this church, we are doing what Christ commanded us to feed the hungry, to do for the least of these brothers and sisters of ours. It's not an added choice. It's not we may choose to or not choose to. It's something that Jesus expects us to do. And we will have to do it until it is no longer needed. And one way is actually also lobbying and working against the injustice that brings about the need. And moving on to holding the faith and seeking justice, one morphs into the other. We have enough food in this world to feed all the world's population. How do we hold that in balance with 25% of children in Scotland living in poverty? How do we hold that in balance with food insecurity and food poverty in the world? How do we hold in balance people in poverty with 59% of food waste in Scotland coming from our houses? If we were better organised, if we were better prepared, if we put some thought into it, we could save a substantial amount of food, which, if you're hard-pressed with disposable income, is a good thing, but which would be even better if you avoided wasting food and donated more to the food bank. And also, we have 20%, how do we balance 20% of our population holding 80% of the world's resources. And you may not think it, but you are part of that 20%. We are part of the wealthiest group of people in the world. Against the 80% that have next to nothing. 26% of the global population live or survive or don't survive on less than $4 a day. 46%, almost half this world's population survives on below $7 a day. That is £5.30. That is two cups of takeaway coffee. The injustice of that breaks my heart. I don't know what it does to you. How do we balance the events, the horrendous events of the 7th of October in Israel with the horrendous events that are taking place now, today, in Gaza and Lebanon? How do we balance two wrongs not making a right? How do we pray? How do we get involved? What do we do? But we are praying to a God who loves us. There's a lot said now about you can only be what you see. And are we struggling to be a people of prayer because we're not seeing people praying? Are we struggling to be a place of prayer because we're not seeing it in action? But I challenge you with the fact that we are seeing the perfect example in Jesus. If we want to see a person in prayer, we just need to look to Jesus. We can be a person of prayer because we can see a person of prayer. We see it in Jesus. We see it in Paul. We see it throughout the Psalms. We see it in Isaiah. We see it in Jeremiah. This has caught my eye this morning. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you a future and a hope. That's Jeremiah, and we love that. We love to claim that. We sometimes forget about the passage in Jeremiah that says, if my people humble themselves and pray. Do we truly humble ourselves and pray? Because if we do, God will turn his ear towards us. And in between all of that, there is a passage where Jeremiah calls us to work and pray for the peace and the prosperity of our communities. 
Can we truly say, and this is where I'm conflicted personally, do I work, do I truly work and pray for the peace and the prosperity of this community? For my neighbours, for my family, for people God has put on my heart. Do we as a church truly pray and seek the prosperity of our community? How does that land with you? The food bank does it, Roma and her team do it. The children and the young youth workers, leaders on a Tuesday night do it. How is God going to use Stuart and Davy and Roma in the future for this community? How are we going to pray for them? How are we going to act with them, to stand with them? And that is the challenge in my mind and the challenge that I leave with us, and I don't say it easily. How can we become a people of prayer and make this a place of prayer? Thank you.